actually UFO is going to run our comics. And, and of course, the Air Force was very embarrassed because we spent so much of our communal effort, our taxes, our national budget is spent in securing our skies. So we felt secure, so we are not going to be bombed by, by an alien force. And they couldn't do much about it, the, about the UFO phenomenon. So th what they opted to do is to look all around the world for the most skeptic, or all around the United States, the most skeptic scientists. And they found it in, doc in Dr. Alan Heine. And he interviewed thousands of people. And he kept saying, oh, you saw Venus, or you saw swamp gases, or you, s you were hallucinating, or there were reflections. And they, they kept, he kept uh, um, doing his job, which he was to discredit all these witnesses. And then one day, Dr. Alan Hynek woke up and he said, I cannot do this anymore. I don't understand what it is. I have not seen a UFO myself. I understand he never saw one. Um, but uh, I cannot keep discrediting all these people who are so honest. They have so much to lose by telling me this. Nothing to gain, so much to lose. And they are coming forward, and I keep discrediting them. I cannot do it anymore. So he quit. Now, I am from Argentina. I came from a dictatorship. If you do that to the military, nobody gets to know. An accident happens to you. And you disappear. And I was first amazed that the man was alive and well and quit. Uh, quit. It just, so I, and then I was the most incredible amazed by the guts of this fellow because he quit his job or got fired. And, had, and then nobody liked him. The military didn't like him, and all those people that he discredited didn't like him either. Well, if something happened. All those people that he discredited started sending him money to support him, and he created a center of UFO studies in Evanston, Illinois. And uh, as I was uh, 1979, I was uh, in my 20s, early 20s, I went to visit him. And we spent three days talking, and he dedicated uh, a book to me. So when I was reading it, he's, uh, he's gone now. Uh, I realized that that was really, I was already involved in this for 20 years. I'm trying to find out what is. I, uh, trying to find out the truth about it. Uh, uh, Dr. Heineck introduced me here in San Francisco to the first abductee that I met in the United States. I met many in South America, but they were different. In South America, the people willingly wanted to get inside the UFOs. They have some that the, U, the UFOs come for tea in their estancia, and, and the children will play inside the UFOs. And, um, and, and here, it was different. It was a traumatic experience for many people, very traumatic experience. And, uh, so he introduced me to several of them. And then I was delighted to find out that Dr. Mack did what Dr. Heineck did 20 years before which is to come to the forum and grab the bull by the horns. This man had so much to lose because he was so high up. I mean, to be head of mental health in, a stamp, in, a, in Harvard University, one of the best institutions that we have in this country, you not only get there by saying the right thing, you get there by thinking the way that they like you to think. You go through so many tests that it's just almost impossible that someone will infiltrate those ranks. So what it really happened is he had a change of mind, a change of consciousness, in which he's had to say, says, well, I have not been educated for this, I have not been prepared for this, I have not read. Thank <laughs> you. 
really very, very happy to be with a group like this and to see the kinds of inquiries that excite you and uh, every one of us virtually relates in some way or other to the kinds of things that, that I feel passionate about. I, I want to thank Sergio for many things, for giving me this chance and uh, also for his hospitality, for his great courage about some of which you probably know, some of which you may not know. And um, also uh, Danny. Um, Danny, uh, as I may or may not say, depending on how this talk goes, uh, <laughs> uh, well, he's, yeah, I will say, he basically saved my ass. Um, is that an expression out here? Uh, I've got to tell you a story about that. Um, Eric uh, Erickson, you know, uh, anyone know that name? If you used to live in Tiburon and uh, sort of after Freud, I think the greatest uh, analyst. And uh, I, another uh, sacrilegious thing I did a few years ago was to invite Werner Erhard to speak at a Harvard uh, a graduate uh, CME, a you know, medical education conference. And the um, medical school insisted uh, that he could come, but he had to speak in a different hotel than all the other. <laughs> <laughs> so he came and we, we, uh, we set up a panel. We set, well, the mic just doesn't work. You get the illusion it's working when you shout and it gets louder. <laughs> <laughs> now, is yeah. that better? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so we put together a um, panel of distinguished people and uh, Margaret Benjamin Gibson, and we had um, to be with Werner on the panel, and um, and Eric Erickson was on the panel with him, and a um, question came up to Werner, challenging Werner and all the uh, vulgarity that, at least in those days, was associated with ass, calling people assholes and all that sort of thing. And Erickson got up in his white hair and great dignity, and he said, you have done something. In California, asshole is a technical term. <laughs> and he said it in his Germanic accent, you know, this one. So, um, uh, my, my passion, overriding passion at this point, is to uh, find a way to credit the source. And by that, I, I don't know, I can't break, I could break that down, but it means the abductees, what they're learning, the aliens perhaps, what they're teaching, the ultimate intelligence in the cosmos that is doing this, all that, that's the source. And it's got something to say to us, and my job, as I see it, is to help, I mean, I don't think, God needs credentials exactly, but the, it, it, at least to say that what is coming through here has something important for us, that it, the source is good and we need to pay attention to it. And that's the, I think that's the paradigm changing craft, which Danny's, I know, devoted to, but how do you bring about that shift of paradigm that in, in the culture that a number of you have talked about? The story that um, Sergio told about Alan Hynek uh, reminds me of a very similar thing that happened in England in the 19th century. Uh, you know, they're searching for uh, the man that would discredit the UFO stories. Well, at, at that, that time, uh, people were uh, having experiences through certain mediums and the spiritism movement in England with ancestor beings and all kinds of other spirits that were, and people were flocking to this and it didn't follow the scientific uh, worldview of the time and the academy was getting more and more upset about this. So uh, one of the scientific bodies commissioned the chemist uh, William Crookes to go and uh, expose and debunk uh, one of the chief mediums, a man named Holm. 
So Mr. Crooks went and uh, he was a man like Heineck of great integrity and he spent some time with these people and uh, he uh, saw some of these spirits, he saw what happened and he saw the authenticity of the uh, work that the mediums were doing and so he came back and reported this to the academy and the head of the academy said but Professor Crooks, don't you know that this is not possible? And Crooks said, I didn't say it was possible. I just said it was true. <laughs> so uh, one of the groups that we work with is a scientific advisory group in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, when we presented this work a couple of years ago, uh, one of the people there was chairing the, the meeting he said, uh, if this is true, it's a game changer. And what he meant by that, and what I have increasingly taken that to mean is that whatever this is, if it's true, everything, and we take it in, and we realize what it's about, as Tim and other people have been discussing, uh, sharing here, then the whole game is different. Who we are changes, our place in the cosmos changes, our relationship to the earth changes, of course to one another changes, the politics, the economics, the institutions, everything is different. Because what it means is that instead of being at the top of the intellectual hierarchy in the cosmos, what philosopher Michael Zimmerman calls anthropocentric humanism or anthropocentric rationalism, we then have to find our place in the intelligence hierarchy in the universe. In fact, the, the arrogance of the dominant worldview is mind-boggling when you think about it because it basically has voided the cosmos of all active intelligence that is not a projection of the human brain. And this means not only that there are other intelligences that we can recognize in the only language we have left, really, which is the language of the material, because it even violates that sacred barrier we've erected between the unseen world and the material world, but it also shows us to be not particularly relatively bright when it comes to the whole <laughs> cosmic hierarchy. Uh, after all, what bright species would take its mother, its earth, its, uh, the earth as its living mother, and set about to, as its principal project the uh, little, by the strangling, killing of that mother as its principal objective. I mean, that's not a smart thing for uh, any species to, to do. So, um, this uh, gets into the whole worldview question, and I can only, in the few minutes I have, uh, kind of put out a, um, sort of a, a framing of the work or touch upon what this is and then because I, I want to hear questions I, I really it's already 25 after we only go to three and I don't want to use up the time talking I want to so I'm only going to talk for a few minutes and then I think probably the main things I have to say or at least someone will come out in, in questions so very quickly um, the um, I've touched on the worldview, and uh, with the worldview comes a way of knowing. Now, I should say something about this game changer thing. The game doesn't change, it's worse than, than we think, in a way. The game isn't changed simply because UFOs are here, or aliens are here, or we prove that, they're, you know, that there's evidence for it and all that. That's, the, that's a minor part of it, the empirical, you know, taking our language, our science, our way of knowing and showing their aliens here. That, that's, that's not the point. What's really important about this is the visitors have something to say to us. Something's going on. There's experiences here. And we don't credit human experience as a source of knowledge. 
If we can't prove it physically, materially, it doesn't exist. I've heard people say that in science. So we don't have a science of experience. So that's part of this game changer. This means that the experiences get to be acknowledged as of fundamental importance in their own right. Because what these people are going through, what they're telling us, the beings they're encountering, the messages of the beings, the transformations that occur in the course of these experiences, all that that we know, and clinicians understand this, through communication, through intersubjective knowing, if you will, through what they tell us. Whether you prove the UFOs are real or the scars or the scoop marks really happen from UFOs, I mean, I, that, that's not the important stuff. The important stuff is what's happening here. And are people telling the truth? As a number of you have had experience to say, yeah, they seem to be telling the truth. So that's where the game changes. What is being learned here that's of fundamental importance? And this is happening all over the world. Uh, Credo Mutwa is a uh, high uh, South African medicine man who's had these experiences, been taken on the ships, had the, all the procedures that are so familiar now. And he said, Dr. Mack, in the name of your sacred country, tell the Americans to stop arguing about whether this is real or not and get on with what this is about. These beings are trying to tell us something. The Earth is one of 25 mother planets in the universe. And it is not ours to be destroyed, and that's what these creatures are telling us. So, try, so that's again one of my passions, and it goes back to crediting the source, which is, let's get on with it. Let's get on with what this is about, what it means, instead of arguing about, is it physically real or not? That's a peripheral, a tangential piece of this whole matter. So, my own experience with this, and uh, then I'll give a very brief overview uh, and then ask you questions, is that I um, had been interested in consciousness study. I had worked with Stan Groff, had gotten some opening of, of my own thinking, but when I heard about Bud Hopkins, who, an artist in New York, who credited the stories of people who said they were taken by aliens into spacecraft, I did think it was a kind of madness. But when I began to see the people, Everything I know about myself as a clinician, it's like uh, Ellie Arroway in contact, everything she knows about herself as a person said this really happened to her, never mind her scientific background. Well, everything I know about myself as a clinician says, whatever this is, these people are telling the truth, and in every respect, clinically, the feelings involved, the consistency of their stories, everything about it, operates like something that really happened to somebody. Except for one thing, it's not supposed to be possible. Now what do you do at that point? You try to squeeze it into your old ideas of what's possible, you say, well maybe what we thought was possible has to be revised. So I went the second route, and that's what got me into trouble. Um, when the dean of the medical school presented me with the letter that uh, told me that there was going to be a, a small committee to investigate me. They never charged me with anything except that questions, concerns had been raised about what I was doing. And he was a friend and he said, you know, John, you wouldn't have gotten into trouble with this if you hadn't said it required that we reconsider our definitions of reality. <laughs> I didn't realize what a poignant statement that was, or have full of meaning at the time, but I, I do now. Uh, I was very naive, and uh, Dan, this is, I'll tell you about Danny in this. Um, we have a mutual friend who's an old Air Force buddy of, of mine from uh, Santa Barbara, and uh, he called up, he thought we'd, Danny was interested in UFOs, and he knew about my work, he didn't know about the Harvard thing, and so he, um, he said, Would you, uh, he wants to get together. So Danny came east a little while later, and we got to talk, and nothing to do with uh, Harvard. And uh, he told me about himself, and then I realized he'd gone to Harvard College and Harvard Divinity School and Harvard Law School and all that. So I said, oh, what the hell? I'll tell him about my case. So I, I told him about my case, and he said, he got really upset. He says, they're going to screw you. <laughs> I said, really? Uh, my lawyer says, not to worry, just go along with what they say. And uh, 
And he said, then he sh found out that the lawyer I had hired uh, was also uh, doing business with Harvard directly himself. So there was a conflict of interest uh, there. And um, so um, we went into battle together and uh, have remained uh, friends. And, and uh, I'm deeply grateful to him for uh, wising me up and also for the, uh, what should we say, uh, uh, full press strategy that we developed uh, uh, to take on the, uh, the university, because I certainly uh, couldn't have uh, found a way to do it uh, by myself. Um, I think Danny was the first uh, high-powered advocacy lawyer for UFOs and aliens that I've uh, encountered. So, uh, so what is an abduction? Then we'll, then we'll, I want to hear from you. What, what happens? What is this? Um, well, there are five or six parts to it, depending on how you do it. First part is the familiar abduction, you're wherever you are, home, car, schoolyard, and there's lights and sound, you get taken up and there's a, into a enclosure, you may not see the UFO, and they poke around and look at you and there's these different kind of beings and, uh, some of them seem friendlier than others, as Tim was saying, and, uh, and um, it's a great shock, and it's a trauma, but it's not only a trauma, it's also a possibility, because as the people go deeply into the, acknowledging their experiences, some transformational aspects, uh, transformational um, changes, huge changes occur in the people's lives, um, there is this controversial hybrid thing where the beings seem to be mating with humans and uh, and hybrids seem to be created and uh, depending on one's point of view the hybrids are uh, part of consciousness or they're part of physical reality the whole question of what is physical what is real gets raised here what what is reality how do we define reality who decides what's real where are the hybrids anyway does it matter are they really flying around in space and they're going to let come and be the next generation uh, after we've destroyed the planet? Is that all literally true, or is it a, a kind of communication of the higher intelligence to us about ourselves saying, uh, we, you better pay attention? And uh, I don't know. I don't know where to place this, but it, it is part of the experience. Uh, another major part is the information, and that's mainly about ourselves and our relationship to the Earth, uh, who we, what we're doing, scenes of destruction through the eyes of the communicated telepathically on television-like monitors, uh, but the, it's riveting for the experiences who may not have had any particular interest in the environment, and they become deeply identified with the Earth and what we're doing to the Earth, and they, that's a consistent, powerful part of the experience. Uh, there are all kinds of energy phenomena that, that convinced me that it was real, that people undergo the light, the way their bodies vibrate when you work with them. To work with an experiencer is they relive their experience is one of the most powerful clinical experiences I've ever had. I mean, they literally shake with the energy that they've absorbed from the encounter, and the, the energetic element of this is only beginning to be recognized and, and studied. Um, then there's um, something I, I don't know quite how to describe this, but it's like it drives people into another kind of thought. It's close to what Freud called primary process thinking, but it's not that. It's it's an understanding of shamanism, an understanding of symbolic thinking, of archetypes, the deeper structure of thought and reality that people, just folks who are not particularly anthropologically oriented, develop. They begin to understand uh, Native Americans. They begin to resonate and are drawn to Native American uh, culture, as ha have I been uh, in, in the course of doing this work. Then there's the, the whole transformational element that I, I mentioned. The, and this is very, very important, that the, the trauma is real. It has many pieces to it. The trauma, of course, of being taken against your will, but not always against your will. Isolated, can't talk with anybody, ridicule, shame in the culture. And then what I call ontological shock, which is, a, which is for the experiencers, like all of us, this isn't possible. They, 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 it can't be, and they'd rather sometimes be told by me that this is a form of madness if I could give them a pill or give them something that would cure it and make it go away, or they want to think it's a dream, even though it happens in broad daylight for some people. And so 
the, and then there's the fact that there's no control over when it's going to happen again, and parents can't protect their children. So there's the whole traumatic dimension. But at the same time, when you hold the energy and the fear and the sadness and the and, and, and the conflict people have about this uh, the ontological conflict, and you you bear that with them the quality of the experience changes into something different. They come to accept it, they see it as part of the evolutionary process, they see it as an awakening of consciousness, they see it as a, a way of remembering who we are, of deepening their, their understanding. And, and then above all, and this is a, a controversial, but I think I have good credentials for saying this since I was raised in probably the most secular kind of background that anybody could possibly have, very German Jewish intellectual, and. You know, God was something that was part of the culture of the Bible that you read, but not, there was no substance to it. So that was my background. But this phenomenon, over and over again, creates the connection with source, with God. And as the beings come to be seen as emissaries of the divine, not, not that they are divine, they can do very cruel, mean things, but. Trauma, after all, as you know, transformation often comes through pain, through trauma. So that, that fact that the aliens sometimes seem not to ask permission for what they do, and then they say, you did agree, and there's this whole debate about did we agree to have them, and people, some, some abductees feel that they, they made an agreement, and, and some feel that that's uh, not fair, to, that's a kind of uh, blaming the victim. But whatever it is, they move to this place where they see the the beings as guardians, guardians of the earth, guardians of them, that they've been with them through many lifetimes, and that they are connected with source, with God, and they, they come to have the idea that what we're learning is that we have strayed so far from source. It's like God has sent a, um, a, a sort of a, what would you call it? It's like uh, scouts or, or uh, a whole kind of um, large posse of beings out to us to, to kind of remind us of how far away we've gotten, to crack us, to open us. And the, and the experiencers, as they open, they, they find themselves in this deep connection with, with source. And they, they, they weep and they weep as they say, well, I want to go back there. I don't want to be here. I want to be with source. I remember my connection with God. And, uh, and then that religious, spiritual dimension of this is tremendously uh, powerful. Also, the re and finally, the relationship. Yes, the be and again, not all investigators of this find this because uh, they don't necessarily go there in a way. But the, the, this kind of cold, indifferent, business-like way the beings seem to work with them uh, initially uh, as if they're following their own agenda, something else cha it changes, a bond develops, some deep connection between uh, one or more of the beings and, and the, the human. And even though the beings have this funny, you know, they, they look kind of funny, or, or a hybrid seems like an awkward, not pretty person to them. Nevertheless, some deep, loving, spiritual, erotic connection develops between the experiencer and one or more of the beings, which they will describe sometimes as many times more powerful than any connection they felt between humans. Uh, Whitley Strieber, who is uh, one of the best known abductees, and I talked with him about this, and he has a mate in the, in the other realm, and, and he said, I couldn't stand that kind of intensity of connection all the time. And so he said that he and Annie, his wife, we've um, talked about this, and what we have on Earth is wonderful, and that distinction between the human connection and the otherworldly connection in the other realm is, uh, they kept quite understandably separated, although some amusing situations do arise of uh, odd, understandable jealousies. <laughs> Just so long as somebody has a mate in the other realm, they can stand the competition, you know, but uh, not as it were uh, in this realm. And it, I'm getting now information about this, these human-alien relationships as being a kind of modeling of relationship, a kind of non-jealous, non threatened uh, a way of connecting that uh, 
is moving us to a different way of, of connecting. Uh, and, and in this case, the connecting is somehow awkwardly across dimensions, which is an interesting matter. It's as if this create the creator in some kind of strange project here of bringing us together, these two species, each, each gaining something. The, the beings are fascinated with our uh, dense physicality, our nurturance, the way we, we, we do have this physical love, and at the same time they, they uh, have this non-jealousy and this connection with source and this concern for the, monitoring the earth and protecting the earth. So there's some sort of joining and different kinds of values that each gains from the experiences. So that's a very, very brief overview of where I see this phenomenon. I, I sometimes speak of it as an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. And, uh, uh, and I, I think that uh, is sort of um, flipped, but it, it is in a way what this feels like, and if, you, if I have to have a sound bite to summarize the whole thing. So I, I'll stop and we can, I want to have some time to get questions. Um, I have a book that I attend and have for seven years. It's a fiction book, and um, the only book that we've ever uh, discussed nonfiction was yours. I read it and suggested it. And this is a group of uh, pretty highly intellectual people, including one member who's a photographer of the National Science Academy. It's the only time the book group ever fought violently, verbally. And um, I thought it was an interesting phenomenon. I, I wonder if you could speak to that when people are confronted with your work. Um, it seems to be one or two reactions. My experience that maybe yes, or what happened in my book group. Well, people can go only so far with this, and uh, I've become pretty uh, understanding about that. I mean, I've been at it for 10 years, and I still wake up or pinch myself when I hear myself saying certain things, like, I can't believe I'm really saying this, you know, I mean, just can't. And we, we had a, I mentioned there was someone, that we had an anthropologist who's a very, very advanced thinker, as academicians go, uh, who came to our Harvard multidisciplinary weekend, which came was a result of my investigation. They said I should have more colleagues involved, so it was suggested I put together a multidisciplinary group to look at anomalies, so we just did that. We had this professor of anthropology from, from Canada, and he was great. You know, he understood, he understood transpersonal psychology and uh, phenomenological anthropology and all kinds of stuff that was sort of close to what we were doing. But it, obviously the weekend shook him up, so he wrote me a letter, and in the letter he, he it was as if he was saying, I, I've got it. I know what this is. All these people are having a non-ordinary state of consciousness. As if that explains something. <laughs> well, yeah, they are. But, uh, you know, uh, if you uh, take, uh, you know, if you uh, subject somebody to some kind of trauma, they may go into a non-ordinary state of consciousness. But what's bringing it about? Why is it happening? I was saying with, with David uh, Ison here that, you know, he people enter a non-ordinary state of consciousness when he puts them on a chair or on a table and plays certain kind of uh, chakra-related chord music and they go into another state of consciousness. But as if, what about the music? What about what they're getting? What about what they're receiving? So he, he, it's like, but I think that the thing that people have trouble, most trouble with, and I see this over and over and over again, is that the principal project, as I understand, intellectually and philosophically, of the sort of Western mind, the, the modern mind, uh, and this has a crescendo in the last 300 years, but you can trace it back to Plato and, and Aristotle, is to separate the non-material, the unseen, the world beyond the veil, and, and the material world, and have certain disciplines, the church, the you know, the theologians, the spiritual people, anthropologists, they can, they can trek, uh, truck with that unseen world and the scientists and the empiricists. You know, most of us will deal with the material world. But what we have no way to deal with is a phenomenon that crosses that barrier. It's like it's, a, it's like there's two kind of squirrels on the, you know, 
both sides of the Grand Canyon. Well, they're, they're, these are, you don't have, you can't have traffic across this, this barrier. And people have trouble with that. They, they, they won't admit it. I mean, I, I presented this at uh, the Noetic Sciences Group, and uh, Fred Allen Wolf, who you know, writes books about parallel universes and all that, and he listened to this talk, and in all seriousness, at the end of my talk, he said, yeah, but John, tell us, is this real or is it not real? <laughs> I said, but Fred, I've been trying to explain to you, reality is complex, and it's, it's uh, you know, it depends on your beliefs, and, you know. So, anyway, other question. Glenn? Pending Carol? I recently, um, it's been interesting, in the Wall Street Journal last year, they had two articles about UFOs. One was about the Chinese accepting and recognizing UFOs. I saw that. And then you can comment on that. And about three, four months ago, about a young entrepreneur who got a very successful company called US Web saying, I'm stepping aside of this full pay $100 million company to study the UFO phenomenon. And he was saying that all our technology has come from UFOs. Well, the, the Chinese, I, I, the Chinese, um, they, they were, I couldn't tell whether this was simply pragmatic. I mean, they could learn from UFOs, and never mind whether it's real or not, they weren't going to get hung up on that. They, they were just going to learn what they could technologically, for military, whatever purposes, and they were open in, in that way. That was what I understood from that article. Joe Furman is a much more interesting and, and complex, and I think beautiful story. I mean, he's a man who, $2 billion company and uh, the leading sort of internet provider for corporations, getting them quickly on the internet. And uh, he has an experience of, of a connection, of a, of a visitation, and all kinds of information comes through, which uh, has to do with Earth and Earth science and what we're doing and the state of the planet. And he, and so, and he leaves the company and devotes his life at 28 to, to this, takes a tremendous amount of flack. I mean, it was a endless articles about him. I mean, he's, uh, you know, everybody tried to marginalize him, and he's he's stayed with it, and uh, you know, I think I, I, I'm tremendously admired him. He deserves a lot of credit and support. That's a big story. Just a collective. Let the hand. Carol? someone else and it's not clear how much of this he, to me how much he really experienced and how much was something that he got caught up in but there there is uh, clearly something that government does try to learn what they can uh, whether we uh, in fact got uh, you know fiber optics from the aliens I mean could be uh, I haven't ever met a scientist who thought so but it, that might be just because it's a turf war of some sort, you know. <laughs> you want to call on people, Sergio, or uh, uh, in the back? You know what, I will take a privilege here, since I'm calling people, I would like to add something on this. Uh, in my conversations with Professor uh, Heinen, uh, he was paranoid about his own organization because of the volunteers that were there. He thought that many of them were infiltrated. They were people of the government who were there 
in order to find out what he knew about the UFOs, because they were, well, this is the Cold War, and we were fighting a war with the Russians uh, to see who had the biggest, biggest technology. And uh, evidently, no, no, not the Russians, no, not, had the technologies of the UFOs. So if they happened to capture a UFO, to get a hold of any part, a piece of the puzzle that would help them to reverse engineer the technology, they were not going to advertise it, because it was national security. So uh, Professor Hanik was saying, uh, probably the people over here, we have to be careful. So we would take walks in the park, uh, just like a spy news, because he was uh, afraid that uh, his uh, office would be back. So we would go and take walks in the park in which we would talk. And one of the, something that Chopra explained later on in the Steel of the World Forum, that our, uh, the, the, the electromagnetic spectrum goes to infinity, as far as we can tell, both sides. And what we can perceive through our senses is so, so, so tiny, so incredibly small. Up to our grandparents, that was the only world, uh, world there was, what we can sense through our senses. In fact, I had to see it to believe it. Well, now there are things that we believe and we cannot see, like radio waves and cellular phones and gamma rays and such. But if Chopra said, he says, we have to be grateful that we have these tiny slits to see the reality that we only can perceive from violet to red and not the rest. Because otherwise, we'll find ourselves immersed in a quantum soup. And we won't be able to put, we won't be able to pin our reality to anything. Because it would be such an incredible mishmash of, uh, can you imagine if you can see, right now I'm talking to you, and you can see in between all the radio waves coming through, and the TV rays, and it would be a mess. So, so, and what happens with the scientists that I think what is happening here is why they put these barriers and when they meet John, he says, oh, you're the UFO fellow and they run away. It's because in order for them, they're already so challenging in the disciplines they are. They're already studying quantum mechanics and they are the shape. So they have to themselves find themselves in this self-defined box uh, because otherwise the reality becomes too mushy and they cannot, they can, cannot have control over their own reality. And that's why uh, we, they keep self-censoring this information because it's just too much to handle. You first and then you and then you and then you. <laughs> Try to be brief so I want to we can get everybody uh, that wants to say something. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking like your example of Fred Allen Wolf and people like that, okay? Um, who are looking for something tangible. Uh, one of the things I do is look for scientists who have come forward. And unfortunately, they're limited, but they are out there. Um, Maurice Chatelain, who was one of the lead designers on the, on the Apollo missions, he wrote a book that's now retitled and back in the publication called Our Cosmic Ancestors. The very first chapter is the Apollo space flight. He says in detail every time they were interfered with. Um, Daniel Fry, who wrote The White Sands Incident, uh, again, you know, uh, one of the lead uh, engineers in, in missile coordination said White Sands. He came out and said I had contact with an automated craft. Um, you mentioned Corso. Uh, Gordon Cooper, our, our lead Mercury astronaut at the time, has come forward on record in interviews and said yes, this is a reality. Uh, as a squadron leader, I saw hundreds of these things flying into formation. Um, I've got the videotape. Um, there are extremely intelligent, credible people who have come forward. The, the, the work is in finding the source, finding them. And my work has been, for me personally, uh, looking at the contact experience in relationship to the abduction experience. And I see two drastic differences. And the people who have what I call contact experiences are met on an egalitarian level. They're talked to uh, with respect and dignity and care. There's a huge difference in, in how the meetings of the minds are coming together. Uh, another one is Orfeo Angelucci, who's an engineer at Lockheed. In the 50s, he wrote a book called uh, um, uh, The Secret of the Saucers. So I'm just throwing these out. And I, I think the situation is changing. I mean, you have Rudy Schild as a leading astrophysicist at Harvard. He's been working very closely with me. I mean, this is, by the way, there's this phenomenon, I don't know if you're aware of it, called quintessence, in which they're discovering this uh, uh, it's a book by a man named Reese, and then some pro I think, at 
Berkeley, that they're discovering that the galaxies are flying away from each other at an accelerating rate. In other words, instead of the universe doing what it's supposed to do, according to theories of gravity and electromagnetic energies, it's supposed to be kind of slowing down and contracting, is in fact got some kind of energy in the void, which is just totally inexplicable by our current uh, understanding. And, uh, so very, uh, yeah, my point is we just have to let go of the old paradigm. Somebody brought up Brian Swim. Brian said to me, you know, we've got it down that the Earth is 15 billion years old. Because in my mind, it could just as easily be 25. I said, well, Brian, so we just add an extra 10 billion? Well, that's interesting. I, uh, I asked uh, another physicist friend of mine, uh, I won't mention my name. Uh, he's a buddy, but a little narrow-minded in some ways. I said, well, what about before 15 billion years? What, what was around then? He says, in our mathematical system, that question doesn't have any meaning. In other words, he's defining reality within a mathematics that doesn't, where that question doesn't, doesn't hold up. Yes? Thank you. Um, I have a question about the opportunity I frankly, in this room, only not to go outside this room. I mean, I, I want to be frank about that program, okay? Because I had a lot of trouble with it. I, I found it. I was, I was very. Let me be polite. I, I was very disappointed, okay, for for several reasons, but just mention two of them. The announcer, his whole tone was so sort of um, syrupy woo woo that there was no possibility that it could be experienced in any kind of sober understanding way. It completely discredited the whole thing right there. And then this emphasis on proof, you know, these, these implants, this physical pellet popping up, and nobody even said that pellet came from experience. It was just a pellet as far as anybody watching this was concerned. And uh, I, you know, don't get me going on the whole implant thing, but I, I think the implant thing is a red, not a red herring, that's not the right thing. What would be something like that? Anyway, it's a distraction in a way. It, it's, it's kind of looking for the smoking gun in the old paradigm. It's a tease, it's a trickster at work. Yeah, there are implants, they're there. People do notice something under their skin, and they, people have analyzed them, and they, they don't, you know, they're a little strange when you look at them, but they're not going to show, there's not going to be a sign that says, this was made in the, you know, in the Pleiades or, or something. So it, it, it's, it's, I don't think that's where the payoff about this phenomenon is going to come from. Yes, and then uh, Brent. Um, and Alison. Can you stand up with you and ask a question so we can hear I know it's impossible to kind of uh, formulate a kind of simple answer to the, the agenda behind the abduction, but it seems from what you say that um, if the principal impact comes on the sort of spiritual dimension of human beings, perception of consciousness, and how that's changed, and it seems to me the whole UFO phenomenon revolves around that. My question is that do you think that this intelligence represents some kind of midwife thing, that we've reached a point of crisis that we will not be able to survive beyond a particular point, and that's we may have invoked that situation on ourselves and then brought these, these, these beings into our realm of reality as a consequence of that. Do you think that's a likely scenario? No, I think you, what you say is, I think you've said it very well. I mean, I, that's close to the way I, I see it. I mean, I, 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 this, I'm very Earth-centered. I see the Earth, you know, as Thomas Berry, someone mentioned Thomas Berry. Thomas Berry said, and he, he phrased this rather beautifully, better than I can, but he said, as far as we can tell, the Earth is the finest product, the finest creation of God of which we know. So I, I don't have to go beyond the notion that somebody out there, some intelligence out there, is concerned about the fact that this species is set about to destroy this finest jewel in the cosmic crown. And that there would be feedback to us about what we were doing. That's what shattered my paradigm. 
I didn't believe there was any intelligence noticing what we were doing here. Can you think what would happen to all the corporations and everything they're doing if they thought there was a, a feedback to what they're doing to the earth or what they're doing to the environment? I mean, it, it could change. That's talk about changing the game. I mean, that's. Yeah. Has it occurred to you that the unusual weather phenomenon that we're experiencing on the planet could be a result of uh, possibly chemotherapy being applied to us <laughs> to radically alter our course of events? It's clearly does. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> A uh, question is channeled from a neighbor who couldn't call in sick fast enough to be here today. Um, the breeding situation, usually uh, more technologically situ uh, advanced cultures meet with le te less technologically advanced situations. Uh, the less technologically advanced usually end up on the losing end of this. You know, are the breeding, is this kind of, uh, you see it for our good or are we pawns? That's one question. Second question, uh, how soon the UFO cable UFO only channel on TV. <laughs> What's your first name again? Paul. Paul? Paul, yeah. All right, I'm going to use your question, okay? This is, I'm not going to be as explicit in answering it as, as you might like, but I want to say something that I feel very strongly. I, I think one of the first things we have to do in this is to suspend as much as we can the way we see things. It was the way we structure our relationships on Earth, the way we behave, where people throughout history, what you say about technology, superior societies take over, uh, you know, less uh, advanced ones. That's, that is the way we do it. But I see no reason to expect that anybody, any other, particularly from what we were saying earlier about, you know, how stupid we are, I, I can't really believe that any other species would be likely to do it our way. But, but the, most Im the most important point is, is more about our minds. In other words, I, I ask people always, try not to say, well, if, if the aliens are X, then why don't they do Y, you know? It's like, I don't know, you know, we don't know how they think, but I see the, the you, know, you know them by, the, by their fruits and by what happens and what seems to, it seems to be telling us. And a TV channel, you think that's happening to it? Is there, a TV, is there an alien UFO, TV channel? UFO only channel coming up on TV that's going to happen? Yeah, on cable. Cable. <laughs> on the internet. We have here someone else? And then you. One, two. Can I confirm with the same question again? What? Continue with the question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in case we are, this planet is destroyed by they go on, just because of this reading your collection book, this uh, egg, a uh, human genetic mm -hmm. part, they're going to keep somewhere and they're going to make another, another civilization of a different planet. Okay. Right? Yeah, the question, if you didn't hear it, is that um, maybe the hybrid thing is because we're really going to destroy ourselves through nuclear war or environmental destruction, so they're going to be seeding another planet someplace else, and, you know, this is an insurance policy. That is a very valid way of seeing it, I think. It's the literal interpretation of, of, the, of the hybrid thing that sort of looks the way we think and so forth and so on. The, po the problem with it for me is that no one's ever seen a hybrid. There isn't one shred of genetic evidence about anything related to the abduction phenomenon. Uh, so it has, it looks like that, but it might also be a kind of consciousness-related phenomenon that, that we don't understand. In other words, I, I think to, to look upon the whole hybrid matter totally literally, I think has to be questioned. It might be just like that, but it might also be something else. Well, again, the whole question of the ontological status of the aliens in the first place, uh, I don't know if they're flesh and blood like we are or have DNA or anything like that. Nobody's ever, you know, shown DNA from an alien. I mean, genetics is the way we think about biological evolution, but there isn't any evidence that, that this phenomenon is operating in a, in a genetic frame. It might be, but people throw around terms like DNA, genetics, genetic engineering, loosely around the whole abduction phenomenon without 
any, as far as I can tell, anything other than it sort of looks like that, but there's not any specific genetic evidence. Here, uh, you're next, then two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> and then we'll quit, right? Uh, we, can we go back? That one is really passionate. We can go well, we, uh, we can go as long as... Yeah, we, we can go... Uh, uh, I, I'm fine. Normally they, they kick us out here, here by four. All right, so don't feel you're trapped here. I mean, you can, you know, if you feel you've been... If you need you know, to go... You have to go. If someone who wants to ask a question needs to live sooner, I will put them ahead of So raise both hands. <laughs> So you're next. Yeah. Um, John, going with, this, with the consciousness uh, paradigm that we were just talking about, the, the idea that the earth is one of the crown jewels, um, doesn't, the, doesn't the human population of one of the crown jewels, aren't they included in the crown jewel? Do you hear? Do you all hear the question? Is, is if the Earth is one of the crown jewels, isn't the human population included in the crown jewels? Absolutely. I mean, we're certainly one of the smarter animals. We have some wonderful qualities. There's some terrific things about us. But to think that the Earth is kind of ours and uh, it, it exists mainly for our benefit, so we can market its resources, as we call it, uh, for our purposes, and I mean, that whole kind of species centrism that we have evolved is, you know, it needs to be re rethought. I think mean, someone said that earlier in the introduction. So might not we be talking about the nature of consciousness and the nature of the power, the human power of choice, and per perhaps the phenomenon that we're discussing is finally human consciousness. Well, yes, I agree with that. I, I modify it slightly. I think that what he said is, could this be human consciousness finding a way to articulate to itself what the issues are, what it's doing, what's happening? Yes, but with just one slight thing, which is I wouldn't put quite that much emphasis on human consciousness. We're getting a little help from someplace, okay? That's the only thing. Words, we're, we, it has to happen. We're participating. We're opening to it, but we're also having a sledgehammer, you know, to us, put to us. I mean, this phenomenon, the reason I think it's captured us so much is that it hits us in our own technological, uh, techno-speak world that we've created. It, it, it's and not everybody, you know, it's not as if uh, you've got, you know, three billion people, you know, doing... Uh, Buddhist meditation and evolving and learning that way. I mean, this is coming from something is doing this. It's not just our consciousness. We're meeting it. It's participatory. That, that's the only thing I would say. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, John, Western science has focused on technology almost exclusively, really, on basic research toward technology uh, in recent times. And when you talk about these ETs as possibly being emissaries of God, you use that kind of language, uh, I hear more about the technological stuff, um, whether it's genetic engineering or what, and we don't hear very much about the message of love. Other than the, the interdimensional relationships you said were happening, do you see this as a way to waking people up to science having disconnected us and the love coming back to connection? Yeah, I, I may not have said that when I talked about the opening and the relationship, but this, this tremendous sense of, of loving connection in the cosmos, of the connection with a loving God, is a very much happens, but but there's a passageway, there's a, a rite of passage to get there. It's not just a loving God saying, you know, be, it, it, there is this hard-edged, traumatic, dark piece to it that it's that has to, I mean, maybe another way to think of it is it's, a, it, we, it's an invitation to integrate the dark side of ourselves as, as well, you know, it's, but the, the love, the, the opening to, to the hard opening part of this is, is very real. Number three? Who was number three? You were number three. I have a very silly question. 
Have you ever had any encounters yourself? Any encounters? No, uh, that's all. That's not a silly question. I'm asked that all the time, and uh, I, I haven't. And I, I think there's, you know, I, I think each of us has our own calling, you know, in a way. You, you, uh, I've had other experiences that have opened my consciousness, but I, in a way, it's as if I can stay clean as a witness of, by the fact that I'm, I'm not. Uh, had the experiences. Uh, Leo Sprinkle, who was one of the leading in, uh, clinicians investigating the UFO abduction phenomenon, he went public with some experiences he had had, and when he did that, he lost his credibility. I mean, that's not right, I'm not defending this, but uh, he lost his effectiveness as, a, as an observer, as a neutral observer. He, he was then seen as somebody who was an enthusiast and you know, had, had been there himself. Yeah. My, my reason for the question was, would you answer? Do you feel like that? Do you feel like you're missing something? Right? That I'm missing something? Yeah. But you kind of answered. Well, I'm open to any. I mean, I, I, I'm not. I, everybody has their edge. I suppose I have my edge. I mean, we, we often get the experiences that we're open to having, and uh, maybe I'm something is blocked in me, you know, I don't know, but I, I'm, whatever, I, I'd be, I'm curious, sure, I'm not afraid about it, I don't find it frightening. You know. Number four. They tend to bring you back, you know. <laughs> you're number four, right? And uh, you're number five, number six, number seven, number the letting green. Okay, I'm just wondering if you tell us briefly how it was that you spoke to the skeptics Society. Was this some, uh, I saw it on TV and I was amazed that you spoke that whole group. It was like a pack of, I don't know what. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. He said afterwards, you didn't know what you were getting into. That's before I met Danny Sheen. Uh, he didn't tell me not to do it. That was, uh, uh, I knew what I was getting into. Carl Sagan is an old friend of mine and was to the end of his life. And uh, we disagreed violently about this. And uh, he was there and I uh, wanted to speak. There was. Uh, it was a chance to speak to 700, you know, people, some of whom are more open than others. And uh, in fact, an interesting thing happened there. There was um, they, uh, there was a woman that some of you probably knew about that uh, sort of denounced me in, uh, to Time magazine as uh, somebody who had done certain things which I hadn't done. And of course, they grabbed the story because it was a, a good story. And uh, and she said she hoaxed me and so forth. So. Yeah, you know, she. I don't think she hoaxed me. I think she was an experiencer who decided to couldn't handle it and saw some way to uh, make make a, a name. Anyway, unbeknownst to me, uh, when I was speaking there, they uh, sprung her on me from you know, and uh, and then she made another one of her speeches about how, what a bad person I was and every, everything and. The result of that was that several people in the group, even though they were not of a mind to be supportive of me, uh, leaped to my defense, attacked the chairman of the whole group and said, what kind of ethics is that to not warn your speaker that you're going to spring on them, somebody who's already in public has uh, de denounced them uh, just because you think that'll embarrass the person. And a couple people got up and walked out and, uh, you know, there was a... It was kind of interesting, you know. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting energy in the room, you know. <laughs> uh, Faith, are you next? Faith. Uh, uh, I just wondered about your research, what, where it leads you uh, about reincarnation and ideas like that. Uh, I've gone through a lot of um, different. Um, I will repeat it. The question is, where do I. Where has it taken me on the question of reincarnation? Um, now, obviously, given my background, I would have thought reincarnation was nonsense. But then, some the number of things have occurred. I, I've read a lot of about it. I've read Ian Stevenson, who's a psychiatrist in Virginia, who finds, you know, doing something very scrupulous scientifically that children who report certain past lives and they can go and find evidence that, you know, for what actually occurred in that past life that corresponds to what the child said and that kind of thing. There's a lot of work like that that's come out. Also, um, 
that when you open people up to the possibility, and again, what we believe determines what we can perceive, but if you open people to the possibility of having had past life experiences, they begin to occur, they begin to emerge. And uh, certainly the people I work with, many of them have had past life experiences. This does open people to all kinds of transpersonal experiences. And then the, the most important thing, though, I think that's happened to me around this is that I, the way I think about what past life experiences really are, is that the idea was, well, you know, it can't be true because how many people can really have been Jesus Christ, you know, or whatever, and, or why doesn't anybody ever have a past life experience that's, uh, that, you know, some humble person? Well, the fact is, people have past life experiences of extremely humble background. Uh, one person in my first book, uh, she's not. In, this story's not in the book, but she, uh, when she um, came, to one of her. Uh, experiences occurred in India several thousand years ago where she sought out the most humble, untouchable, and then what usually happens is they enter the, the being at the point of conception, in other words, the consciousness, which is, first of all, you have to have a place in your mind to separate consciousness from the physical body, otherwise how could you even begin to think about this? And that, of course, in the Western paradigm, there's no separate, there's only the physical body and consciousness is simply a phenomenon of the brain. So you have to get rid of that idea before you can even begin to think about this. People that you see, though, are they always, when they speak of past lives, are they here on Earth? It's not somewhere beyond this? this? Um, haven't had past lives from on, on other planets. And then, then I, I don't think of it, I think of it less and less literally, too. In other words, I think of it. question about that, but it raises this whole question which, which we've only just hinted at here, which is, what do we mean when we say something is real? Do we mean it's materially real? Do we mean it's experientially real? Do we mean it has effects of some sort? Uh, definitely it's real, but then that's only the beginning of the conversation. Uh, Bruce, uh, Ellis, do you still want to ask a question? Oh, okay. Uh, you're a second time, so let's wait for the people who are first time. So Bruce, okay. Two things are of interest to me. One is the, the whole phenomenon of denial in our culture. Uh, I'm working with a Y2K cancer preparedness group, and when you talk about Y2K, you get this, most of the time, just a total disconnect. They just disconnect. And, and you're experiencing that with this, so that, that whole thing of how you stretch your reality limits what stretches them for you, how you go around the mirror. That whole thing is of interest to me. And the other thing is, what, what is your leading question now in, this, in your time? What, what is it that really is drawing you from where you are right now? Well, there are two things. Uh, I'll take the last question first. Um, there's, there's the content of the research. We have several research projects going on in, in Cambridge, but my, my own passion is to learn more deeply what is, what do we have to learn? How, what, how this gives access to the infinite and the intelligence of the infinite and what we can learn and to follow the, the opening, in a sense, out there uh, and what it tells us about our, ourselves. The other is what I started the talk with, which is, um, what your, really goes back to your first question, which is how do you, how do you, give credibility to something you know in some way is profoundly important and true, but which people will turn to, don't want to hear. You know, it doesn't fit their reality or threatens them in some way. How do you identify what exactly is threatening and then get ahead of the curl on that and acknowledge it? And that whole technology of accelerating paradigm change. I mean, I, this sort of flip thing that you get from Tom Kuhn, well, it changes when the old professors die. I mean, we don't have time for that. We, we have to learn how to engineer paradigm change in a scrupulous way, uh, you know, in a, a much shorter time frame. Thank you. Good. Hi, this is a personal question, Dr. Rack. Since you've had the opportunity to communicate with so many people that have contact with do you 
your sensitivities, your intuition, and would enhance them more. When you're working on an intellectual level, but on an emotional level, um, and even an intuitive level, are you finding yourself more in tune with being around people who have had this experience? Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, hedge a bit on that. Um, I mean, I, I ask you, you know, I think the hardest thing for a person to know is how they are changing themselves, if at all. And as people, that's really not a question that, that I find easy to answer about myself. I mean, I, I think so. You know, I think I'm more open, more intuitive. My heart, I'm more heart opening. I can take things in, take things in more easily that, that would otherwise. I'm less judgmental. You know, I can sort of. If I trust my senses, tell what's going on with another person. I wouldn't call myself psychic, but you know, it's a, but I, yeah, I think so. You know, energetically changing, and uh, but you know, it's it's a hard thing for, for me to. And my whole life has changed in every respect. So you know, I have a professor who used to say the way you're going to tell people have changed or not is have they changed their lives and gotten new friends. Well. Yes, <laughs> all of the above, you know. <laughs> so. Wait, here we have a statement there. No, I said, off the record, I said John seems a lot more relaxed than he was some years ago. See, that's what you learn about. <laughs> because this group is no test for that, you know. <laughs> No, not too easy, but uh, compared to some of the groups I deal with. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are two more questions I will ask to end, but Jim, you, you I, My question is that. Okay, it was us. Everybody? Yes? Nikki has a question? Okay. Sonia has a question. Okay. Um, when I think about like, aliens, Oh, this is one of the, I'm surprised that wasn't asked earlier. Um, this is the question that I put in the category of the demography of aliens, okay, uh, which, about which I am not, what? Oh, the question is, uh, uh, most of the aliens are described as these little guys with the big black eyes, three, three and a half feet tall, is that what I'm talking about? And um, there, uh, Jim Harder, who's an investigator at Berkeley, some of you may know, he says there are 30 alien civilizations out there that he's been able to find one way, I don't know how he finds them, but one way or another, he says he's found. Well, you know, first of all, I don't even think in terms of civilizations. Again, that's a projection, I think, of the way we organize ourselves. I don't know if they operate. They, they often will say, you know, the alien is very interesting. The being, I find this fascinating. The beings will often say to us, you know, we really don't exist in form as you would understand it. But to get through to you, we have to take a form because you don't have any other way of knowing but through your senses to know form. I find that very interesting uh, because that, and so this whole humanoid thing could be just, you know, slapping together a form so they can show up for us, something like that, you know. Now, having said that, um, the ones I hear about most are the ones you mentioned, the little greys, and there's usually a leader on the ship of that group that looks a little older and has, you know, more wrinkles and a little taller, and um, they call it a doctor. And um, then there are the luminous beings that are kind of taller and more spiritual and seem to, then there are some ugly reptilian kind that uh, do really horrible things and people hate. And then there are ones that look like praying mantises, and then there are ones that are just human on the ship, like folks, you know. And then there's human-like ones with, uh, you know, uh, sort of cat-like eyes. And you probably, some of you are in this business, so you've seen other kinds, but those are the main ones. I don't find 30 civilizations, but um, you know, there's a lot of ethnocentrism around what kind of aliens you get. Um, uh, early on, I remember uh, one of the British investigators coming to a conference, this was at MIT about seven years ago, and she said, you know, in Britain, we don't have those little greys with the big black eyes, and we get these tall, blonde, Nordic beads. They're the only ones we ever see, you know? And, so uh, a couple of years later, I was on English television on one of those morning shows, and uh, Richard and 
Judy. Any of you know the show? In, in, out of Liverpool. So they had a call-in thing. I gave a little five-minute talk, and they said, call in, you know, if you've had any experiences. In a half an hour, 25 minutes between the five-minute spot and the question and answer period, they got six or 700 calls on their seven phones, of which every one virtually sounded like the little grays. You know, I, I never want to tell anybody about this, but I was driving along, and then there's this beam of light, and then there were these little beans, and they were, you know. So almost all of them were like, the great, not all, but most of them were like the ones we have. Okay, so, oh, you're new. Yes, the first question, uh, what time it is? I don't know. 3.30. 3.30. Okay, so why we don't do this? And then those two and those are repeats. Yes? And I would like to put a question myself. All right. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you first. John, uh, one of the things that I, I get a pretty good sense of, both from having read your book, being in a group, uh, a conscious group like this, and just uh, notices from the society, people are concerned about uh, you know what we're doing to the planet. Um, I, I was wondering, do you have any sense of two things? How much time, what kind of clock is running? How soon do we need to act? And, and what is it that we need to do? Um, well, again, you know, um, I'm going to say something I've never said before, uh, because I just thought of it a bit, you know, as you were talking, which is that we, the images of destruction of the planet, is, it's already happened. In other words, what we're seeing are images, the apocalyptic images are reflections of, tr of a truth that is ongoing and present, both in the psyche, which has been the old paradigm as it's represented in images and its destruction, the, what the Zen uh, masters called the daishikyo, the great death that of the old paradigm, of the psyche that's attached to the old paradigm. That's happening collectively, individually. Uh, so the, the catastrophe is now. So the, the linear idea that, you know, at a certain date, this is going to happen or that's going to happen. I, I have trouble with that. First of all, I've lived long enough to see the dates revised several times already. Now, maybe 2012 is really going to be it, but you know, I, I've had too many certain announcements that this year or the next year, and that's all linear time stuff. And the, the real thing is to move into the other dimension, and I think that that relates to your second part of your question, is what should we do, which means everything, full time, now, totally, commit, fully committed to protecting the earth. I mean, that's what this is about, I think. Because it's my first time question, I, I go first, and then we have two repeats, and we should thank you. Uh, my wife and myself have uh, devoted quite a bit of time in uh, going around the world to collect evidence that they were uh, technologically advancing the city in four hours. Uh, some of them I did on my own, uh, some of them with Sakurai Sichi. Recently we were in uh, uh, East Lebanon and we saw stones building Malbec, the foundation of Malbec, that uh, are over 2,200 tons. And they are perfectly fit. I have pictures in my office that so you can see later. And, uh, and then uh, last week we were in uh, Cusco and we saw those stones with 12 angles that absolutely fit perfectly one with another. It's several tons. We don't know how to do it. We went to Olantaytambo and we saw massive, incredible, huge rocks that are perfectly look like uh, uh, Lego sets. They are perfectly square and uh, perfectly carved with holes and such, all engineered. Uh, we have no idea how to do it. We don't have idea for what it was done, but evidently it was not done by the civilization that we have now in Peru. And what I was trying to do is to bring to the forefront this evidence. And I found out that every time I tried to convince a scientist, they said, oh, that thing again. And they move on. And they, uh, they don't want to see it. It's like a science has a big elephant sitting in the living room, and everybody's passing tea around the elephant. <laughs> it, well, that means here is incredible evidence in our planet today of technology that can build things that we cannot reproduce 
today, with the, our best technology, we cannot do it. We cannot transport, we cannot lift, we cannot deal with things so much. And nobody's paying attention to that. Because I think that, why is that? Why is I'm running into these walls? Well, I think it's, uh, what you're talking about is very f familiar to me. Uh, the Marion Foundation had a whole conference on rewriting history, and, you know, Graham Hancock uh, spoke there, and they've had Colin Wilson, and, you know, Eric, you know, Eric Vendenek, and who was, again, was discredited because he, he, you know, he's kind of threw his stuff out pretty fast and wasn't always as tidy as, as he could, but he found, you know, the naphtha lines that in uh, Peru, I mean, there's, there's huge evidence of what you're saying, that there have been highly technologically advanced civilizations that could do things we don't even know how to do now, uh, thousands of years before the official history uh, begins. And again, I think that's, if you, again, that's a, um, sort of another type of ego death to, for the idea that we've progressed, you know, in, in certain linear ways. And, uh, but again, um, the rejection by uh, mainstream science, because they have to rewrite everything, they have to, you know, send everything back. It was, uh, um, you know, what was it, uh, oh, uh, Jeff Mason's remarks, you know, when he, uh, this is a psychoanalyst, a guy who left psychoanalysis and he uh, went back into all the old Freudian texts and, uh, and he discovered that uh, many of the materials were suppressed and uh, that, uh, that, that, that at the very least lent themselves to other interpretations and pa patients hadn't necessarily gotten the best shake. So he said, um, if this was accepted, then uh, all the uh, patients that uh, of the last 70 years would have to be recalled like the Pinto, you know. And, uh, uh, so, I mean, it, there's a huge investment. Now, Rudy Shield, in fairness, to capture this beautifully for me, is my friend who's very open and just very, very interested and, and supportive. And he, um, one day I was going to have lunch with him at the uh, Harvard-Smithsonian uh, Institute, which is, uh, and he said, you know, uh, we better be careful here. I don't want anybody to see me uh, here with you uh, having lunch, you know, so we'll have to go someplace else. And, he said, you know, these buildings, there are tens of millions of dollars invested in these buildings, and if what you're doing is really true, then, you know, they're going to have trouble keeping that funding going like that. So, uh, you know, this game-changing thing goes right to the economic core of the, of the society. We'll have to wrap it up. You have a passionate question? So that's it. One, two, three, for one. What? Yeah, go ahead. I'll repeat it anyway, whatever you... The question is, uh, could the Jesus Christ and the Fatima incident be uh, related to UFO? Uh, the short answer is, is yes. There's a there's a investigator by the name of Joe Lules, um, who is a um, former professor of journalism, uh, also uh, and, and a UFO investigator. He's now in business, and he's written a book called The God Hypothesis, in which he goes back to the Bible and finds all of the texts that seem to indicate that, including the ones surrounding Jesus, that indicate that there was some kind of contact then. Again, that's textual reinterpretation is, is difficult. The, the Fatima thing is really fascinating. I mean, I, I'm not a Fatima expert, but I've been there and I've read the stuff and, uh, you know, apparently uh, some object in the sky that, that people said, well, the sun fell out of the sky. Well, and, or a bright object went, you know, round and round and thought it was the sun. Well, the only thing we know that does that are, you know, some kind of UFOs. And, uh, so the, the, there's been a lot of written about the Fatima incident, which was in Portugal in 1917, that, that's thought of it as being UFO related. Uh, there on the back, um, uh, you're all, yeah. you have more questions? Me? Yes? Yeah, I just thought, you seem to be, to give my question, slightly making a bet, right? Because on one side you're saying yeah. you know, that we're discounting the um, an increasing amount of empirical physical evidence for both abduction and UFO phenomena, which is kind of important to ground it into our reality. And then 
other side is putting it into some quasi consciousness realm that sort of acts in a very symbolic manner, which is beyond comprehension. Yeah, I mean, my, my question is that, you know, I mean, if, you, if you go that route, then why don't you, you expand out further into some, I know J.J. Hotak's work talks about the interaction of ultra terrestrials, the notion of higher spiritual beings and a hierarchy of spirituality that, you know, that, that, that opens up that whole world. In that sense, you have that kind of activity going on. I'm not uh, discouraging physical evidence, and I think that the grounding of it in physical evidence that we have is helpful, it's useful. I think it's uh, not robust enough to satisfy any hard-nosed physical scientist, and I think we get ourselves into more trouble than we get help when we say, but look at this evidence, look at that evidence. I mean, take any, like, for example, okay, my situation, you can have your own examples. Take the skin lesions, okay? Little scoop marks, sometimes symmetrical, uh, triangular shaped marks, uh, sometimes they're roseate, you know, look like nothing anybody could do themselves. You know, look like the aliens did it as far as I'm concerned. Fine, okay? Can you imagine what would happen if I presented that to a dermatologist at Harvard Medical School? And what would they say? Well, yeah, it could be, you know, but it would come up with a more conventional explanation. It does, it's not robust. It doesn't hold up. It, it's a tease. It's real. It, but, but if you present that, or cut, say, or a scoop mark, you know, well, you know, it's real. I think they're abduction related. I don't understand them. But uh, they're not as useful in convincing anybody. In fact, it's usually the weakest part of anybody's presentation when they try to present physical. I argue with Bud Hopkins about this all the time. He thinks it's very important, the slides and all that, and you should have physical evidence. I think he, I think it's a distraction. I think when people get all arguing, is it really, were, the, were those cuts really done by alien instruments or not? And you know, that whole, all the energy of the discussion goes into that yeah. rather than what, what it's about. Yeah, it's corroborative, it's interesting, it's helpful, but I don't think it's where the payoff is. But I know, I mean, if you take it out of context, you know, if you take this as a detail of context, then it becomes a kind of curiosity. You know, but, then again, but if you don't accept the context to begin with, you just answered your own question. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, we'll take the last question from Wally, but uh, before, uh, I want to point out Dr. Mark found it here, which is uh, an organization that supports people who have had uh, extraordinary phenomena. And you can find information, and you can become a member. Uh, the website is in the invitation for May 14th. That you will have, I think, the liberty every time that someone speaks to put their email. I hope yeah, also, if people want these newsletters, I didn't bring enough for everybody, but if, if people want uh, to know more about Peer and what we're doing, to, they can write to me at, uh, I don't know, is the address is, is it on the invitation, the address? Your email and your website. But not, not the regular address. Some people, not everybody in the world does email, you know, uh, yet. Not almost, but at least, you know. I mean, we actually do have a snail mail address, too, which, which is up here. What is it? What is it? It's right here at the end. It's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Do you want me to read it? Who doesn't have email? You don't have email? Do you want the address? Yes? Uh, the address is PO Box 398080. Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts. 02139. And for the view that you brought, I will give priority to the members of the press who are writing an article on this because this is background information for them. And then if we have a few leftovers, you're welcome to it. The other information that we have there is a book on Y2K, the best one I know is called Awakening. And it's available for $10 or 10 papers. It's somewhere there, I think so, in that table. Um, that's it. I think enough for announcement. And May 14 will be caused by Bruce Wayne. Um, Holly? The gentleman who talked about memes in our society, speaking of perhaps the message here, do you think that one, the abductees are the medium for the message, and two, uh, that the rest of us, through uh, those memes, we have abductions, UFOs, uh, aliens, 
TV is in books. Pretty mainstream now as far as uh, the language as a whole. But the abductees introduced this into the society as a whole, and then through television and other media, we're all incorporating it into our consciousness. Well, the, the messages that uh, come through the abduction phenomenon are not unique to the abduction phenomenon. They come through near-death experiences. They come through almost all the great spiritual traditions of uh, people talk about love. Uh, they come through uh, the re-looking at all of our religious traditions that are going on now. It, the abduction thing has a particular power, I think, because it it has this odd way of getting people's attention. It, it, it seems to challenge the paradigm, and, it's, and by challenging the paradigm, it cracks the mind. And when you crack the mind, then some of the information can get through. I mean, I've actually run into people that can see all those amazing crop formations in England and other places, at Triple Julia's, and extraordinary things, and they say, well, you know, there are a couple of hoaxers in England that did that. And it, it's like unbelievable. The mind is simply, you know, somebody's got to change that mind. And it doesn't matter how much, you know, how many near-death experiences there are, or how many uh, good photos of crop formations. Or if you don't so trans radically transform the structure of thinking, the, the sort of materialist paradigm, then the information won't get through. And I think that's what we've all been talking about in terms of the state of the world forum, is that uh, what are the technologies of accelerating paradigm change? And we don't have much experience with that. Thank you very much. Yay!